Welcome to another episode of the Billy Ho Show. Before we begin, going back to the old days, we used to get these, and uh, this is the Post Office Savings Bank Money Box. And it says in the instructions, you can pop into the bank and bank a penny or a threepence at any time, but if you put it in this box, there's a little slot at the bottom there, and uh, there's a little round thing for notes, you slid the note in and you put your coins into that slot. It was as good as banked, because when you took it to the post office, they're the only people that had the key, and they unlocked it and took all the money out, put it into your account. And uh, as I said, it was good as banked. So these probably came out after the war. But, and, um, I, I'm just not quite sure when they started, but it's got a, uh, a King George crown on top of the post office sign, so that's what makes me think it's before 1953. It also came with a savings book and um, it says on the back there all about how you use your money box and it costs four pence, four pennies, four cents. <laughs> and inside it's, uh, there's the post office stamp and uh, how much you're, you're putting in. In this case, this belongs to my wife Linda and um, she put in $3.00. 13 shillings, or uh, three pounds, 13 shillings and threepence, two pounds, 11 shillings and threepence, two pounds, nine and fourpence. This is how much money is coming out of her, uh, her savings box. So she's obviously saved it for a, a year or so. And, uh, and what did you get? It were uh, pocket money, that's right. Your parents gave you pocket money. And in my case, it was ninepence. And that was enough for sixpence to get into the into the movies on a Saturday afternoon matinee, and threepence to buy some lollies or something like that, jaffers. They had um, a penny, just a, a penny that popped in there. Or the next coin up was a was a threepence, and that went in there no problems at all. And then we had uh, a shilling, which was called a bob, and uh, two shillings was two bob, three bob, four bob, five bob, ten bob. <laughs> There's a 10 bob note, and that just went into the little roundy piece there that pushed in, and your 10 shilling note was in there. Can't quite put that in, the hole's a bit small, but anyway. And then where there was a, a, a half a crown, or two and six, and then there was a crown, which was a, a quite a big coin, but I never ever saw one of those, but they were about, at the time, five bob. So the money situation back in the day was, uh, you know, you for, uh, for an ice cream today at the pictures is about eight dollars. Eight dollars, four pounds. And we were, you know, you could buy all sorts of things for a penny. Now for an ice cream, four pounds, unbelievable. But anyway, that's, uh, that's that. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna scoot down to Nelson and talk to Roger Humphreys. And uh, Roger's just restored a 1915 Model T Ambulance, uh, very interesting. So let's pop down to Nelson and talk to Roger. With me is Roger Humphreys, and welcome to our little show. Thanks, Bill. Roger. And Roger's built this um, First World War ambulance. I think it's a, a, a Ford T. Model T. And uh, Roger's going to uh, explain things to us, why they had things where they had them and, and things like that. And it must have been one hell of a job with the mud and the slush trying to get bodies and people and all oh, the rest yeah, of it yeah. off, the, off the battlefield. It must have just yeah. been horrendous. That's it's, all you can really say. Yeah, well, as far as we gathered, the, um, during the First World War, they had horses and had wheelbarrows and that to get the injured out of the, in the Somme and back to the... Then they put them on a rail from the, you know, a mile or two back and then they sent them back to Blighty or wherever they were going, we had, depends how bad injured they were. But then they had, these Model T's were made, this is a Canadian one, they're also made in England. And they found that they're very usable and um, they took them into France and um, they put the injured on the side. Do you see the stretches up the top here? And then they, they clipped them on the side, we'll take a photo on the other side, and um, away they went. So they got two at a time, the nurse sat here, and the driver there, and they took him back out and 
especially it was at night time, they were very cautious to the fact that if they had the lights on, they were shot at. So uh, they used to drive around in the dark, hoping they wouldn't get just follow the a light in front if they could find the light. Yeah. There was a, a man called Peter McKenzie who had a, uh, a FWD truck from the Second World War. That's right. On the uh, diff. Yep. It had a round dot that's right. that, that, that people could follow yeah, that's dead right. underneath yeah. the truck. Quite a lot of them, so they couldn't see it from, from looking up. They're looking down onto the... Uh, most of the, the uh, forces were up high looking down onto the, like the English and the, and the New Zealand troops, and uh, they could look out. So when there's a light in the back, right. they couldn't... You know, they'd follow the light, and that's exactly what happened. They followed the light underneath the axle. Hmm. If we go on the other side there... You guys come over here and we'll have a look at the controls. The stretcher sits on the side here, Roger, and so I guess there's a reason for that. Yeah, well, this to lay the, the patient on here, head up this end, feet down here. Because the body work was so short, they couldn't slide them in the back of the oh, unit. Okay. Later on in the years, well, during the wartime, they extended the bodies another two or three. The wheelbase was the same, so a bit like a, a seesaw. <laughs> and they put the patients in the back. But in the early stages, this is how they put a, a chain here. This all collapses up and goes back on the top when they're travelling. So he can talk to the driver? Yes, and the nurse in here would talk to the, the other one patient on the other who on the other side. Yeah. Wow. So once that was done, the chains were down and you lifted it up and you put the patient and you took him away. But after that, you'd fold it up. Yeah. <laughs> simple. Absolutely Very easy. simple. Yeah. yeah. So what, what year is this, roughly? This, these were 1915. This one here is a later model. This is 1923, this one's, but we just yeah. made it into a... It's a very similar type car, same sort of moving parts. These were the first ones that had the steel radiator shroud around the radiator. The early ones were brass. Can we have a look? Yep. This, this here, the, the tin cover there, was all steel. This was the early ones were brass. They call it the brassy. They didn't, they ran out of brass for making the cartridges for the ammunition. So made a steel cover for the radiator. Wow. Didn't waste anything. No. <laughs> Come have a look at this. Now, this is pretty much one of the very first engines ever made, really, aren't they? The, the, the Ford made these very early in the piece here. He made 14, 14 million or 15 million of them over the period of time. So is this when, is this the time when steam was thought might be the way to go or, or, or electric might be the way to go or petrol engine might be the way to go? That was all up in the air it until, was all up until in he air. invented the tin lizzy. Which the is tin, pretty much this is the this tin is. lizzy here, that's right. Yeah, so this was the, the petrol driven one and the early ones, as I had the brassy ones, and before that they had the horse. Wow. And these were the start of it. Um, and, and then there's something called tremblers. Trembler coils, these, these fellows on here, these are oh. the ones for the spark. It hasn't got a distributor. Down on the front there, there's a make and break, and that makes, and it does all the timing for individual cylinders. So when it's, when it's running, it's, these trembler coils here are just a, a, like a vibrating doorbell yep. with a secondary coil, and it, it generates a high spark, which makes the engine go. <laughs> That's amazing, isn't it? So really? it's an amazing, amazing feat. Absolutely. No water pump, no petrol pump, no oil pump. <laughs> it's wonder it goes. And he made 14 million dollars <laughs> <laughs> today wow. with their different yeah. things. We've done a few modifications to these just so they, you know, going uphill you'd stop, you'd run out of petrol because the petrol tank's under the seat. So yeah. you had to turn around and then back up the hill. Yeah. Turn around and then go the right way again until you got to the next gas station. Yeah. So pretty well, as I said, a little four-cylinder engine, updraft carburetor, the um, six-volt, they had a battery in the back. The original ones had dry cell. These had a later version, had a magneto, so you went from ignition on battery and you flicked it to the magneto, and it took a lot of the burning away from the points on the trembler coils, and they, the actual engine boosted a bit of power out of it as well. So when you, if you own one of these, yep. get to A to B, <laughs> You know, you'd, you'd probably have to sort of service it every week. <laughs> it's all the, you know. Right. Uh, well, I suppose it depends where you had it, where you were going. They did have problems in the early days. When you turned the key on, they, they would start on their own. You didn't have to have a turn the compression. They would, they would fire up. 
And a lot of the mother would go into the shop to get something, the kids were in the car, they turned the key on, next thing the car was in the shop as well. <laughs> well <this laughs> was, is a crank they were quite pop. dangerous when it came yeah. to that sort of thing, yeah. So this, this is a cranking? That's the cranking device. You've got, this is a, a later one, it's got a starter motor. The, oh, the okay. early ones never had starter motors, they only had the crank in the front. So when well, did they get starter motors, roughly? Phew, I think starter motors in the... Must have been 15 or 16, I think. Oh, really? That early? Around, around about there. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And then they uh, modified. They, these, the last one was made in 1920, 26 or 27, I think. Then the Model A came out in 28. That's the first of the Model A's. These are all made in Canada. They come out as kit set and all assembled in New Zealand. Wow. So here you go. Here's a new car. Off you go. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Yeah, so this one here is we just made it out of bits and pieces we and, found. And, so, and the lights, are they electric? Yep, all uh, all six volt lights, yeah, they all go high and low. And wow. And, uh, well, there you go, folks. That's something <laughs> completely different. Um, the old Model T is an ambulance. It was just, a, it must have been horrendous in that war. I just, you just got no idea, really. Terrible. But to see the simplistic, um, you know, engine, the simplistic everything. It's just amazing. Yeah. Good uh, on you, Roger. You still drive good as gold. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> what I've got here is a copy of Talking Trucks. This is a book I wrote a couple of years ago, and it's the history of New Zealand trucking. And uh, it's all from the programs that I did between 2013 and 2016. I'm going to let this go for $25. So uh, it's a special. Uh, Christmas is coming up, so if you'd like your copy, there's my phone number, 027 277 just send me a text, or email me, billhoheffer at extra.co.nz to get your copy. $25 and the history of New Zealand trucks. A couple of years ago, Linda and I went to America, and we travelled up the west coast of America, crossed the border, and into Canada. And what we were doing there is looking at the trucks that they built in the well, early century, the 20s, the 30s, and the 40s, the 50s, 60s. And uh, we're just comparing what America had in comparison to what came here. And in the early years, um, we had Model T, Republic, Federal, um, trucks were those names. And from England, we had the Leyland, the Thornycroft, and, uh, and trucks with those names on them. So what we're going to do is look at the American trucks and, uh, and just compare what they had, horsepower they had, and things like that. So let's pop to America. And the, the logging truck, folks, is actually a Mac. And I'll just read what it says on the side here. It says it's a 1923 AB Mac. And down the road, 500 miles back, we saw an, uh, an AC Mac which was the one with a sloping bonnet, but it also was 1923. So obviously at 1923 you could, you could buy both models if you wanted. The, uh, Mac, the AC Mac has got the radiator back here and the engines in front of it. And that's the one that went to the First World War, where it got the Bulldog name. And uh, the Bulldog, I see there's not one on this, but sooner or later the Bulldog's going to appear on the Mac. and. Um, yeah, so it's just interesting that there's two models built in 1923. Interesting. Here's a good idea, Rick, and I haven't seen this, or I've seen it once in a truck in New Zealand, where you just, it's got a little lever there and the door slides back into the panel. And you're not going to get it, there's nothing out here to, to catch, there's nothing out to break, there's nothing for it to fall on. It just slides in there, in and out of the way, yep. slide it back and you're on your way. What a yep. great idea. Yeah. What a great idea. Logging, ink. Florence. Yeah, they're they're still in bid. This truck still belongs to them. Oh, okay. And and they still haul logs. Yeah. Wow. Not oh. with one like this. No. <laughs> no. Nineteen. How do you say that? Doan. Dome. Dome. They just pronounced it Dome. Oh, okay. Transfer truck used by Oregon Oregon Transfer Company. What did they transfer? Well, one of his last jobs was to haul freight from the rail yards to the downtown merchants in Portland. Back in them days, the sidewalks were 18 inches off the ground, 
made out of wood because it rained so much. Yeah. Wow. And they would, there's a winch on this, they would winch, the cargo come in big crates, and they'd winch it on here out of the bus car, take it to the man who ordered it, downtown merchant, and they'd winch it onto the sidewalk in front of his store. He'd come out, open a big crate, and take his stuff inside. So it was like the first container? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> but I like the engine, them two jugs there. Yeah. Look at that. And they built the rain engine, or is that somebody else's? I think that is a, uh, oh, they got a name for it. I can't think of it. Uh, so, so the Walkish, did you say Walkish? Walkish. Walkish. Uh, matter of fact, in the store. Uh, yeah, Waukesha. Yeah, Waukesha. It's a Waukesha engine. And they had Continental, and there was another one as well. That if you bought enough of their engines, they would actually put a put your logo on the yeah. on the side of the uh, exhaust manifold. But again, they, they like the uh, they like putting the little front on. I suppose this is the you know modern day version of a bull bar. Well, that stands. See, Portland is called a Rose City, so that's a Portland Rose. Oh, okay. Rick, this uh, you were telling me before is just about the the front axle across this. Maybe yeah. just explain that to my viewers. Well, it was one big billet billet of steel, and it appeared to be cut out with a cutting torch. Just a bit. <laughs> well, so boy, go and cut this. Here's the measurements. Get on your welder, get <laughs> gas axe that out. You got yourself an axle. No problem. Nice. <laughs> and um, somewhere along the line, somebody's decided that in America we will be on the left-hand side. Right. Do you know when that happened? Uh, I, think it might I don't know for sure when it happened, no. I, I, think, I think Mr. Tilt from Diamond T, I think he had something to do with that. Could have. Yeah, amazing. But this... Uh, a lot of your truck manufacturers back in them days stole ideas from each other. <laughs> See, over in England and France... They're coming here pinching ideas. Well, somebody here, this dome maker, decided he would go with their idea for the steering wheel. I mean... <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we went there. <laughs> well, there he is. Done, as in don't are. <laughs> Not the no. end. That's a yellow knight. They're very rare. Okay. This is the only one we got in what we call barn fresh because we figured we'd never get another one. <laughs> barn fresh. They come <laughs> right out of the barn wow. into here. Yeah. So, what's well, the date? 1927. 1927? Really? They even obviously made their own engine. Yeah. yeah, they did. Uh, there's a knight holding a shield in armor. That's the reason why it was called a yellow knight. Wow. In World War I, all your six-cylinder engines were taken over by the government for military. Well, he couldn't call himself a Gur-6 anymore. But he had a lot of body parts, but no engines. Okay. So uh, Mr. Kent tried to buy him out and didn't have enough money. So he went to a Mr. Worthington, who had more money than good th good sense, I think. But <laughs> he went with him, and they bought Gur 6 out. Well, they had to figure out a name. Kent and Worthington. This become Kenworth. Oh. Wow. But the neat thing about this is, they come to our truck show every now and then is one that looks exactly like this. Same color, same everything. But instead of saying Gur 6, it says Kenworth in there. I want that truck right there. <laughs> so you got one point. Well, that's amazing, folks. We've been looking at Kenworth on our way going back to probably the 50s. But here we go back to, the, to 1917 and when Kenworth was born. Actually, yeah. he was born before that. Oh, really? That's when he, about yeah. when he sold out. Oh, right. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, so they've been around a long time here. The first skin, there it is. 
like I say, that other one that says Kenworth right there, exactly the same. Because they used up his parts that he'd already had made before they started building their own. Wow. Wow. Amazing. Federal is a truck that came to New Zealand. Um, up until about 1940 something, they've got Federals. And um, this is 1922. And I wonder how far back they go. Four cylinder, continental engine, as I was saying before. They yeah, I, they go back a long ways. I, I really don't know when. Sure. Looks good in black. And um, Republic also came to New Zealand. Yeah. And, um, and that's my oldest truck. Is it? Oh, okay. That's 104 Mighty. years old. Wow. I just love the little Republic logo just yeah. sitting on the top there. But um, the guys have restored Republics in New Zealand that, that look you know, just as good as this one does. But the, the grill, the top of the radiator, I mean, it's the same. Um, yeah. So this one's 1912. I think the ones we were looking at were 1918, 1920, 21, around about that era. But they still had this same looking yeah. grill on the front. They never had this, of course, but very close. Wow. 1934 Fagil. Yeah. We got that right. But just looking at this, it's sort of, you know, it's got the square cab, but it's it's a big truck. Yeah. I don't know what size the engine is. What does it say? 150 horsepower. 150 horsepower in <laughs> 1934. <laughs> What I like about this, Rick, is, is this little blind arrangement up here. Obviously, you can pull a wire in the cab there and add a bit more heat to the engine. Yep. But, but in our time, we just had little buttons here. And you just put a, a canvas yep. over it. And you can, and, but a bit of cardboard or... Anything. Just but this is pre the louvers. Remember the, yeah, the trucks right. come with the louvers? Yep. they got automatic louvers now. <laughs> Yeah, they do, yeah, just whatever the heat's required, the, the truck thinks for itself, you just got to yeah. steer it, yeah. Wooden, wooden bumper across there, yeah. decent headlights. And this is the, the more modern version next door? Well, this is actually older than this one. You're joking. No. What? That's a 1930, this is a 34. But <laughs> now I'll give you the story, the reason why it looks like it does. This was owned by Tidewater Barge. They took and used it up. I mean, they totally used it up. They put it behind some grain elevators and left it. Well, then they decided they wanted to restore it. Well, by then, you couldn't get any of that parts. But Fagile become Peterbilt. Uh, okay. So. The early Peterbilt parts are right there. That's how they had to restore it, with early Peterbilt parts. That's the reason why it looks newer than that. Than that. <laughs> so so, so how, did, how did it become Peterbilt? Well, let me think on that a minute. The Federal brothers were going broke back then. And a uh, timber tycoon from the Pacific Northwest wanted logging trucks built his way. So he went down there and he got all he could get out of receivership. They went into receivership on these trucks. He got it, took everything back to Seattle and said, I'm building these trucks, I'm putting my name on them. His last name was Peterman. Peter. That's where Peterbilt come from. Right because he was building them. So Peterbilt has a reputation in New Zealand anyway of being the sort of like the Rolls Royce or the top of the range of truck. Nowadays they're all the same. Oh, okay, so at this time you could put whatever engine you wanted in it, whatever diff ratios you wanted in it, whatever gearbox, yeah. you could just, and then he would build it, a bit like Kenworth. Yeah. Whatever you want, we'll make. Yeah. Yep. And it'll have our, our name on But it's, it's interesting that Mr. this is the pre predecessor of Right. Of Peterbilt. The Federal Brothers actually had a bus line that went clear up into the 1960s. Wow. And they, they kept that, but yeah. this went into receivership. Wow. Can we have a look in the, um, at, at the engine? The, is it a, 
the federal federal engine, or is it something else? I think they're all uh, Cummings engines. Oh, okay. All right. all I need to do that. Yeah. That's a Cummings 150, and this has got a Cummings in it also. Sure. But I'm just saying again, once again, you know, this is this is what's available in 1934, 150 horsepower. Yeah. As opposed to 80. <laughs> We looked at one of these yesterday in Munro in a big pile of derelict trucks and this one had white freight liner. I got one here, down there. And, but you're calling it a, a, a bubble nose. Right. Only because it pops out of it. That's Yeah, it's only, it comes out a little bit where your cab over straight up and down. Sure. Here we go. This is what we looked at the other day. It had the white, white freight, freight liner. Oh yeah, so here we've got the changeover period. Yeah. yeah. Well, this one back here which is older, says Freightliner. That's, oh, okay. This is a 52, this is a 54. 1954? Yeah. 1952? Yeah. The um, air cleaner is just behind the, right in front in, of the passenger the seat, seat. If, if you have a passenger, but this is the intake for the air cleaner. Yeah. That's it. Just, <laughs> yeah. wow. They had to keep the Freightliner the white name when they got together and I think it was white that actually bought out Freightliner <laughs> but they had to keep the white name so long when they got together. I think it was about three years and then they went back just to Freightliner. Let's have a look at this photograph folks and uh, Lockie is driving this international which looks similar to this but it too had a suicide door. In Taramanui at one of the truck runs we were doing there was a photograph going around about what sort of truck did you think this was and it looked a lot like this and um, but I thought it was a you got to slam it I thought it was an international and uh, but it could have been an auto car like this but when you look at getting in this um, Rick I mean that's yeah I've been in and out yeah, sort of hopefully the wasp that, that's, all that's where you should be getting into most trucks and you just <laughs> swing yourself around you know you And you're in, sort of. Now I'll tell you the rest of the story. The reason why I don't get in it too often is it's got a lot of wasp in it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hooray. Well, and the old snake. Well, I got a lot of spiders, though. <laughs> but it did have a lot of wasp. They might be well, hibernating yeah. now. It's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine instruments in front of me here. Uh, a reasonable steering wheel. I don't think it's power steering, is it? This will be all Not uh, power strong. Mr. Armstrong, as I saying, it's it's a very cozy cab if you've got somebody with you. But um, the commas had the uh, <coughs> the entry up in the front here too, and the only thing about it was the panel right there. Which if you um, if you're getting into thing, that happened and you went flat on your bum. <laughs> yeah, that's the reason why you turn around, come up backwards, yeah, yeah. come right on down. <laughs> that's nice and flat. But anyway. Then uh, next step, then the last step. Easy. But there aren't too many trucks with suicide doors, although there are a few, but you're looking at one of the rare trucks in the world, a suicide door. And you can be the proud owner of it. <laughs> and it's for sale. Rick, it's for sale. There you go, folks. <laughs> it's about three grand to get this back to New Zealand. You own a very unique truck, and uh, it's for sale. Why not? My 2021 truck calendar is now available, and here it is. It's a picture on the back of all the trucks that are on for each month, and the one on the front is a uh, Lodestar Austin, I think 1950 or 1951. But these are available at Wickles, Paper Plus, and a variety of independent uh, print stores or bookstores. Well, that's our show for this week. I hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you all again next week. Mm -hmm.